Uh, thank you, uh, John and Audrey, for those uh, kind words. I have to say we had some tech problems at the beginning. And I, uh, given the talk, I think it might be the NSA intercepting our communications. But uh, Mark uh, set up a firewall, and it's, it's all saved. So the work here I'll present uh, today is based on preliminary research uh, undertaken with the generous support of a digital studio research grant. Um, as John mentioned, my work sort of uh, veers from uh, you know, 20th century poetics and art, um, uh, uh, science and literature, and, uh, and digital archiving. But where I think it comes together in some sense is in the in intersection between 20th century lit and art media innovation and the communities that emerge from this intersection. And I think, uh, I think that'll be true of the work I'm doing today, which uh, I should mention also grows out of another interaction and ongoing collaboration with my colleague, D. Morris. Uh, for those of you who know her, uh, whatever I say here today is the product of our minds uh, in conjunction. And we were doing some research for this project in, uh, in London at the archives together, which was fantastic. Um, at any rate, uh, again, this project is in a preliminary uh, state of affairs. Uh, and it it began when Dee and I started to notice maps everywhere. And some of you have probably noticed this too. But for us, it, a remarkable number of maps in very recent art and new media poetics. So together we set out to explain why. Now, um, I'm throwing around this term counter map, so I might as well do uh, as my colleague uh, Garrett Stewart has taught me to do, which is begin with a slideshow. Um, and I think uh, we, oh, look at this, shameless, shameless promotion. <laughs> shameless promotion. Um, I, I will undertake for about five minutes uh, a game of show and tell. So here, uh, a gallery of images. As its title suggests, the Institute for Applied Autonomy's Roots of Least Surveillance plots roots of least surveillance in Manhattan along with alternative routes that best avoid them. Jake Barton's memory maps, designed as a living archive of personal geographies, participants pin their stories onto massive geographic maps of the NYC boroughs. These personal stories were then entered into a searchable online repository inviting visitors to explore its diverse communities and characters. Hmm. Simon Elvins titles his Braille map of the city, Silent London. We expect that maps are visual, abstract. Here, not only is Elvins map tactile, it is also interactive, requiring physical touch, an analog touch screen, if you like. Brazilian artist Vic Munitz's WWW world map made from junk computers, a large-scale installation piece comprising discarded electronics is then photographed as a stunning triptych. We hear the litany of terms vying to describe the financialization of the world economy, a logic variously dubbed late capitalist post-Fordist, and post-industrial. Its chief characteristic, we are told, a shift from industrial to information economies. Munitz's work is an elegant rebuttal to the already cliched talk of cloud computing as that clean, green digital world. Shadows from Another Place by artist Paula Levine is a series of transposed maps using global positioning systems coordinates to translate and represent the impact of terrorist or military actions that take place in one location upon another. The artist asks, what if international gestures such as terrorism or war were like boomerangs that return to sites of origins with an impact equal to the one enacted? 
What would such actions look like if they landed in other backyards or our own? So here is um, Baghdad uh, uh, transposed upon <coughs> San Francisco. Speaking of backyards, Catherine Clark's foreclosure series consists of realty maps reconstructed as quilts. The prominent rectangular marks are holes in the quilt. An ironic gesture since quilts provide historical record typically for poor communities and often during, often during difficult times. John Klima, Earth, investigates the world as it currently exists in data, a geospatial visualization system that culls real-time information from the internet and positions it onto a three-dimensional three model of the planet. In a way comparable to Vic Munitz's WWW, Earth engages the problem of finitude. A swelling data glut is growing, possibly beyond the capacity of the internet's invisible spectral infrastructure. Eric Palos's participatory urbanism are uh, air samplers with carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. Sensors were mounted onto taxis along with GPS units in the uh, Ghanaian capital of Accra. The environmental data collected showed citywide pollution levels, which in turn mirror city poverty to the letter. The artists hoped their work would enable poor communities in their bid to enact political and environmental changes. Billed as an interactive uh, documentary, Jeremy Mendez and Leanne Allison's Bear 71, and I'll show you a bit of this, uh, chronicles the life of a grizzly bear in Canada's Banff National Park from the moment it's tagged and collared. The story is told in the first person by the mother grizzly bear, but it's visualized as a series of data points and through surveillance camera footage in the park. I'll just uh, show you really quickly what this looks like. It's actually a very interesting um, use of mapping for uh, to tell a narrative. I don't, I don't have the song uh, sound on, but here you play the human, and you get to see the natural environment of the park um, uh, uh, affected by highway creation and the encroachment of, of human beings onto the park. And you can stop at a, um, along the way, when you stop at a, uh, a video camera, it shows the bear interacting with this human encroachment. Uh, and it's a quite fascinating story. It takes about 20 minutes to read. And finally, I'm cheating a bit here. This is not so much a map as it is a diagram or chart. Uh, this is the now somewhat infamous uh, They Rule. Uh, the interactive site developed by Josh On and, uh, Josh On and Future Farmers one of the most discussed maps in recent years, technically a chart or diagram, uh, plots the relations between government officials, corporate conglomerates, and university donors in a matter of seconds. The site also acts as an archive and exhibitor of its best illustrations. If any of you have seen um, um, Mark Lombardi's Global Networks, it's almost like a, an interactive recreation of his in incredible uh, network structures. Okay. Uh, scholars such as Dennis Wood, uh, Valerie Kivelson, Martin Bruckner, and others have argued persuasively that the field of cartography emerged principally, at least initially, as an instrument of state power, fortifying its boundaries and mapping its planned expansions. Wood would remark uh, polemically that, quote, maps blossom in the springtime of the state. This hyperbole aside, and he claims there were no maps before 1500, again, I think a kind of polemic to link them to the uh, emergence of the, of the, uh, of the modern state. Uh, there is an undeniable explosion of map making during the 17th century and after. Uh, the map manufactured a sense of national unity, 
often among disjointed regions and disparate communities, while its perceived permanence could give the impression that newly appropriated lands were always state possessions. Maps initially appear innocent, a neutral representation of the Earth's surface, a factual measurement of here to there, an unpro unproblematic picture of the real. Of course, maps are anything but innocent. They are systems of propositions that tell stories and make arguments at a particular time and in a specific location. With this in mind, I offer the following provisional, and I say provisional, definition of a counter map. A counter map artfully subverts the typical coordinates and protocols of traditional map making in such ways that privilege social action. Just as the map affirmed the nation's sense of itself, it also gave rise to countless tactics for reimagining relationships between place space, and community. Working between aesthetics, political protest, technological innovation, and community development, counter maps do their part to imagine other possible worlds. Now the list of tags are numerous. Art maps, emotion maps, protest maps, community mapping, data maps, neo-tactical or radical cartography. Anthologies such as Catherine Harmon's The Map as Art, Jacobs' Strange Maps, and Liza Mogul and Alec Alexis, I believe it's Bahatis, Bahats, and Atlas of Radical Cartography have all been published within the past four years, confirming, I hope, that these admittedly strange maps have in the 21st century become curiously prevalent. Now, certainly one could source these diverse art mapping, mapping projects to uh, countless precursors that long date the 20th century the allegorical and utopian tradition of imaginary maps, for instance, of which Thomas Moore's Utopia is perhaps the canonical example, and which still plays an important role in creative map making in the past few decades. I didn't really have reason to bring this guy in, but I just couldn't uh, stop myself. Fluxus Island in Decollage Ocean might you know, be a treasure island for artists. Um, uh, or a kind of utopian space for art practice. <coughs> More modestly, I'd like to trace briefly two converging uh, lines of unconventional map making, and I will say among, among many others. One takes place within avant-garde art practice, the other in community-based protest cartography. I'll give you a second here to look at this. Uh, one of my favorite things to look at, the surrealist map of the world. But I should say just before that, um, that the counter map looking backwards, uh, uh, while it enjoys a marginal status to be sure, is present in almost every major art movement of the 20th century. Data, futurism, surrealism, concrete and visual poetry, fluxus, conceptual and pop art, and of course situationism whose theory of the derive offers us not only an antecedent practice, but also a nascent theory of countermapping as lived experience in urban space. So here, the surrealist map of the world, a map we could easily spend hours discussing. Uh, the image appeared anonymously in the, a Belgian magazine in 1929. Two points of immediate interest, uh, the Pacific rather than the Atlantic occupies the center vanishing Europe to the corner while North America has been swallowed up by Alaska and Labrador. A 1925 Surrealist Manifesto provides some context, quote, even more than patriotism, which is a quite commonplace sort of hysteria, though emptier and shorter lived than most, we are disgusted by the idea of belonging to a country at all, which is the most bestial and least philosophic of the concepts to which we are all subject. Uh, Zara would make similar con comments with his signature petulant nihilism. He'd say, uh, quote, civilization is still shit, but from now on we want to be shit in different colors so as to adorn the zoo of art with all the flags of all the consulates. <laughs> there you go. Uh, next we turn to data's most militantly political center in Berlin. A work by chief member of Club Data and one of the architects of photo montage, 
Raoul Hausmann's data conquers. Uh, the word data, and this, this has been a, a well, dis thoroughly discussed uh, uh, collage, but if you notice at the top, you have data written over half a globe, and then again, you have it, it's hard to see, right here on the brain. So data has maps on the brain. And why this is, uh, seems to also include a kind of uh, objection to rapid nationalism and war. Art instead should triumph the world over. Uh, here we have the data, uh, name of the piece is Data Conquers. So here um, art should be the only conqueror. Okay. Psychogeography. The technique of transient passage through a city's ambient locales, <coughs> movements that trespass against those for which an environment was designed. The red arrows indicate the forces a given neighborhood exerted on drifters freed from the typical motivations for moving. The map is here akin to Zara's famous cut-up poems. Take a map, take a pair of scissors, cut out neighborhoods, put them all in a bag and shake gently, take them out again, and there you have a new city. What are we doing on time? Oh, I'll show it to you. These are uh, spatial, uh, Miko Shiomi's spatial poems. They don't quite fit the logic here where, you know, we see a sort of avant-garde practice fusing with a, a more explicit political critique, but it's important in a number of ways. Uh, what the artists did here is enlisted collaborators from around the world to participate in events performed simultaneously, after which they would return documentation uh, to the artist. In the first such map event pictured here, artists were asked to write a word or series of words on a postcard and return it to sender. In the second, and this is great, uh, artists across six time zones were instructed to record their precise actions and the directions they were facing at exactly 10 p.m. Greenwich Village time on October 15th, 1965. George Machunas, for instance, was spinning himself on a spinning chair in a freight elevator which was going up in New York. Part instruction work, part performance piece, part concrete poem. Spatial poems reimagines the site-specific happening event as a performance event, as a global fluxus event, while its synchronicity even anticipates certain locative new media works experimenting with GPS and Google Maps. The fly, here we have the analog to the flash mob. Okay, radical cartographers, like their artist counterparts, have sought to challenge and expose the ideological under, underpinnings of maps while still recognizing their usefulness in social justice activism. Here are two examples from the influential geographer William Bunge and the Detroit Geographical Expedition and Institute. On the left, a more traditional uh, attempt at visualizing child death statistics titled Citywide Pattern of Children's Pedestrian Deaths and Injuries by Automobiles. On right, we encounter Bunge's adaptation of the same map statistics titled Where Commuters Run Over Black Children. Thus renamed the De Detroit's own city of memories becomes a protest map documenting another consequence of white flight. This map and numerous like it were the central focus of a project in experimental urban geography whereby teams of amateur geographers drawn from the community conducted surveys of Detroit's inner city. If cartography traditionally maps outward toward new frontiers of unexplored terrain, Bunge's approach is to move inward toward those pockets of place not undiscovered but ignored or exploited. The map itself isn't new as such. John Snow's 1854 map of cholera in London, Charles Booth's poverty maps of 1899, and the groundbreaking work of the Chicago School of Sociological Research were likely Bunge's own touchstones. The title, on the other hand, is the word of the trickster. The Detroit expedition's crucial innovation might be understood to inject data's play, the situationist derive 
into the field of traditional cartography. And with that, three loves converge. Avant-garde mischief, <coughs> cartography undertaken by activist urban planners, and innovations in media that expand and extend cartographic resources to amateur mappers. Countermapping has now found a central role in digital poetics, new media art, gaming aesthetics, and hacktivism, and thus occupy, occupies a place at the forefront of, techno, uh, of technical innovation in art, making extensive use of global positioning systems, remote sensing satellites, and geographic information systems. No doubt one uh, notes from the foregoing slideshow a transition toward more dynamic, interactive digital tools and media, allowing, for instance, documentation of real-time data flows, um, and when I imagine the maps I want to be made, and I say to myself, please make that map. I think of uh, these advances as allowing us to map the movements of, oh, I don't know, a bank's collateralized debt obligations, and offshore tax havens. We could map, we could counter map the human genome by visualizing that part of it currently controlled under patent protection. But perhaps a cautionary remark is healthy here. Let's not simply covet cool toys. Let's not lose ourselves in the unbridled enthusiasm and perpetual cheerleading of a Wired magazine article. Eugenie Morozov, in a fine book called The Net Delusion, rightly admonishes a certain cyber utopianism in new media and digital humanities work. To be sure, Palos is participatory urbanism, the one that mapped pollution over Accra, makes use of advanced digital mapping and broken down taxi cabs. Mendez and Allison's Bear 71 likewise blends interactive data maps low-tech surveillance footage, and the geographic records of uh, a national park. In each case, one finds the necessary combination of technical resources and cleverness to tell that story. Our newly detourned GPS, GIS, and satellite-aided tools follow a similar route as the map. Its initial use as an instrument of state expansion and surveillance, such that a similar shift takes place from military R&D to the public sphere and commercial use. <coughs> At present, the map is becoming something else altogether, a different sort of abstract representation of data merging with the camera's eye and the search algorithm to form a hybrid amalgam of the photographic image, infrared scans, eavesdropping devices, facial recognition, and 3D mapping software. But after whistleblower Edward Snowden's NSA disclosures, boundless informant, prison, X key score, each program more far-reaching, more ubiquitous than the last, such work seems somehow quaint. Meet Gorgon Stare. I'm not kidding. This is a real thing. Lieutenant General Larry James the Air Force's Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance explains, quote, instead of one soda straw sized view of the world with the camera, we put essentially 10 cameras ganged together on a Predator drone. And it gives you a very wide area of view of about four kilometers by four kilometers, about the size of the city of Fairfax, Virginia. Now, he explains, I can look at a whole city. What's important here is that Gorgon doesn't just produce a really high resolution image. It can chart a target's movements, where he went, who he spoke with. It can intercept cell phone, text, and email data, and then map this information, often in real time. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the literary critic in me pays close attention to names. In Greek mythology, a Gorgon is a monstrous female creature of whom Medusa is most famous. Impenetrable scales, fang teeth, and hair of living snakes. So terrifying are the Gorgons, their image turns its victims into stone. 
Presumably the pun here is on motion capture, which the Air Force hopes to evoke. Again, cool toys. A recovering drone operator working in Nevada, uh, carrying out strikes against populations in Afghanistan by the name of Omer Fast, quit his job to become an artist. And he's since created a, a map-inflected cinematic work called 5,000 Feet is the Best. I can show you a little, uh, do I have time? Yeah, maybe not. I'll just show you the visuals here. Um, on the left, top left, is what, pr approximately what a uh, drone operator's workstation looks like. Um, and below are infrared uh, uh, images of a, uh, of a drone attack. And next is part of a, um, a digital cin and cinematic, or a new media work by Fast uh, documenting, uh, doing the best to restructure and, and capture what a drone operation actually looks like, but over a California landscape rather than a uh, Afghanistan landscape, such that uh, uh, it has some of the same effects as the uh, uh, San Francisco Baghdad work, shadows from another place. Okay, so looking back at our mini exhibition, what I'd like to highlight here is not a difference marked by available technologies, nor even a specific situational tactic, but rather a fidelity of purpose. Whether one is mapping cities for the blind, warning of shrinking wilderness, or charting the circulation of capital, we are invested ultimately in how we occupy, share, and defend a common world. In this regard, the Detroit Geographical Expedition is instructive. Bunge formed it, in 1968, initially drawing support from Wayne State University. Described as an experimental community college, the institute provided free courses to Detroit residents in cartography, geography, community activism, and urban planning. And by 1970, the institute enrolled 500 students in 11 courses, at which point funding was terminated and the uh, institute was forced to close. Yet in this short two-year stretch, the expedition and institute produced countless maps. Some were published in book form, such as Fitzgerald, Geography of a Revolution. But more important, arguably, was a series of reports directed at community members. Chief among them, a report to the parents of Detroit on school decentralization and, ge and the geography of the children of Detroit in 1971. I love this name, The Geography of the Children of Detroit. The first of these was used extensively by community groups to expose systemic racism in the Detroit School Board's proposed redistricting plans. The second is just as significant for what the title evokes. Bunge and his colleagues sought to map human activity and not the Earth's surface alone. Radical cartography should disturb the assumptions that a map is a discrete multiplicity of inert things. It should represent the dynamic spatiality of moving relations. Bear 71, for instance, represents the relations between humans, animals, and an encroaching urbanization. Not so different from Bunge's map of child deaths, which we should dutifully note is also a map of how children play, and the incompatibility of this human activity with unsound <coughs> urban planning. The point here is that countermapping, if it is to have value beyond a momentary provocation, must be a tool of sustained social action. It should document and subvert the proprietary enclosures of our common world. And with that, I will, uh, I will end not with the Gorgon stare. Something that, yeah, let's. George Machuna spinning on his chair whilst going up a freight elevator. Okay, thanks very much.